Hello all. We'll continue with our series of discussion with regard to the important topics for the preliminary examination 2023 from the subject Indian Polity. This would be our class number five. We'll directly get into the first question. The first question is related to the National Judicial Appointments Commission Bill, which is recently introduced in the Rajya Sabha by a private member. We have already discussed as to what is a private member bill. So, in this question, let us try to understand what is this National Judicial Appointments Commission and what is the present system of appointment with regard to the judges in the higher courts, that is both in the Supreme Court as well as the High Court. And also this National Judicial Appointments Commission is not the first time that the government is trying to introduce. Earlier also it was introduced. So, we will see as to what has happened to the earlier initiative taken by the government. Now, again it is introduced as a private member bill. So, anyways we will try to understand all these things with regard to the judiciary. Let us come to the question. Recently the National Judicial Appointments Commission Bill 2022 was introduced in the houses of the Rajya Sabha. So, it was introduced in the Rajya Sabha, which is related to the system of appointment of judges in higher judiciary. In the context, consider the following statements. So, before I get into the uh, statements, let us try to understand few information with regard to the National Judicial Appointments Commission. In the year 2014, the National Judicial Appointments Commission Act was passed earlier by then government and in addition to that they also passed the 99th Constitutional Amendment Act. So, by inserting the, these two things that is by bringing in the 99th Constitutional Amendment Act and also by passing the NJAC Act, they are trying to transfer the power of appointment of judges to higher judiciary which is right now done by the collegium system to a commission which is called as the NJAC. What is the difference between the collegium and the NJAC? The collegium today comprises of only a group of judges. It includes the chief justice of India and certain other judges who recommend the names for the appointment of judges to the higher judiciary which in 2014 by amending the constitution they tried to transfer that power to NJAC which would comprise of executives as a part of this, it would also comprise of representatives from judiciary and which would also comprise of certain eminent personalities from the general walks of life. So, all these three group of members would decide that. But however, this uh, initiative which the government has taken to bring the NJAC was struck down by the Supreme Court in the year 2015 on the ground that it violates the independence of judiciary. So, this has already been struck down. Now, again a private member bill is introduced. So, let us try to understand before we get into the question as to what is mentioned in the constitution and what is this collegium, what is the origin of this collegium system. So, it is very important for the examination. So, for which we'll, first we will have to understand as to what is mentioned in the constitution under article 124 of the constitution and also article 217 of the constitution. Article 124 of the constitution talks about how the judges of the Supreme Court can be appointed. It says that the president can appoint the judges of the Supreme Court. It is only that the president before appointing the judges of the Supreme Court has to consult the chief justice of India and certain other judges as he may deem necessary. Okay? So, nothing else is specifically mentioned. So, the most important word under article 124 is the word consultation. Let me just come back to that particular word. Similarly, under article 217 of the constitution, the president has to consult the chief justice of India and certain other judges including the governor of that particular state and the chief justice of the concern high court before appointing the judges of the high court concern. So, this is what is mentioned in the constitution. But however, the system that we follow today is the collegium system. This is nowhere mentioned in the constitution. So, what is the genesis of this collegium system? for which we will have to go back to what happened in 1970s. 1970s, you might know that is a time there was a great conflict between the political class and the judiciary. 1973, the Supreme Court came out and gave a judgment in the Keshavananda Bharati case. They restricted the power of the legislature to amend the constitution. 
and subsequent to the Keshavananda Bharati case, then government of India, which was led by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, she has for the first time superseded three senior most judges and appointed the fourth senior most judge as the Chief Justice of India. Not only this has happened and subsequently there was an emergency time from 1975 to 1977. During this time of emergency, more than 50 judges, more than 50 judges of the High Court has been arbitrarily transferred. Judges of High Court. Now, all these arbitrary transfer of judges and certain other cases were challenged in the Supreme Court. And this is for the first time that such matter was brought in front of the Supreme Court. So, when the matter came in front of the Supreme Court, it came to be what is called as the S.P. Gupta. S.P. Gupta versus Union of India case. So, in this particular case, not only the transfer of judges was brought to the notice of the court, but also the appointment of judges to the higher judiciary as to how the judges have to be appointed. And what is the meaning of the word consultation that is given in these articles? So, in this particular case, the Supreme Court made it very clear that the consultation would amount that the president should just, just should take the opinion of the Chief Justice of India. But however, in case of the conflict, however, if that opinion is not acceptable to the president, then the primacy will be to the president. So, by this particular judgment, the primacy of appointing the judges was given to the executives. But however, the matter did not settle. Soon after, there was a lot of public opinion against this particular judgment. And again, the matter was brought to the Supreme Court. So, this was in the year 1981. And again, the matter was brought to notice of the Supreme Court in the year 1994. In the case which is called as AOR, Advocate on Records versus Union of India case. So, in this particular case, the Supreme Court has revisited its earlier judgment and it has altered its earlier judgment. So, now the Supreme Court is of the opinion that the President has to consult the Chief Justice of India before making the appointments to the judges of the Supreme Court. But here the consultation would amount to mean concurrence. That means, in case of differences of opinion, the opinion that would be given by the Chief Justice of India is binding upon the President. But however, in order to moderate the power of the Chief Justice of India, the Supreme Court also for the first time innovated the concept of collegium. The Supreme Court categorically said that the Chief Justice of India should consult two senior more judges in the Supreme Court and then give the opinion to the President and such an opinion is binding upon the President. That means, for the first time, the collegium came into existence only in the second judge's case and then the collegium would be Chief Justice of India plus two senior judges of the Supreme Court. But however, in the year 1998, when Justice M. M. Punchi was the Chief Justice of India, few of the recommendation that was made by the collegium was not acceptable to the government. And hence, under Article 143 of the Constitution, then President of India made a reference to the Supreme Court with regard to the same issue. Now, the Supreme Court reiterated the same thing what has happened in the Advocate on Records versus the Union of India case that whatever is the opinion that is given by the Chief Justice of India and the Collegium is binding upon the President. The only thing that has happened for a change is that the Collegium has been expanded with regard to appointment of the judges of the Supreme Court. So, today, after the 1998 presidential reference, the collegium would include Chief Justice of India plus four senior most judges. Okay. So, this is the understanding that you should have. So, with this understanding, let us just get into the question. Look into the first statement. Presently, the system of appointment of judges to the Supreme Court and High Court is based on the collegium system. Yes, it is very much true. After the third judges case, the S.P. Gupta case was considered to be the first judges case. The advocate on records versus Union of India was considered to be the second judge's case and then the presidential reference made in 1998 was the third judge's case. So, even today the collegium system continued to exist which the government tried to replace through the 99th constitutional amendment act which has been struck down by the Supreme Court. Statement 2. The collegium system consists of the chief justice of India plus four senior most judges. This is very much true. In case of appointment to the judges of the Supreme Court, after the third judge's case, 
the collegium would comprise of chief justice of india plus four senior most judges in case of appointment to the supreme court and two senior most judges of the supreme court in addition to the chief justice of india in case of appointment of judges of the high courts this is very much true the collegium in case of the high courts i am repeating it again it is chief justice of india plus two senior most judges as per the second judges case that is true but however in the third judges case the collegium with regard to the appointment of the supreme court has been increased to chief justice of india plus four senior most judges so this particular statement is also true third statement the collegium recommendation is binding upon the president provided that a larger consensus within the collegium before the name is forwarded to the president so this is also very much true after the third judges case the supreme court has made it very clear that whatever is the recommendation that is given by the collegium is binding upon the president but however before the recommendation is forwarded by the chief justice of india to the president at least the chief justice of india plus three senior most judges has to be on the same page that means to put it in other words even if two senior most judges within the collegium is not okay with the name that is to be forwarded then such a proposal should not be forwarded by the president to the chief justice of india and even if he forwards without such an concurrence among the judges then such an opinion is not binding upon the president so yes there is a need for larger consensus before the name is forwarded all these things are very important so with this information just come to the question choose the correct answer from the quotes given below so statement 1 is right statement 2 is also right statement 3 is also right so the answer would be all of the above so before i proceed to the next question there is also a collegium with regard to transfer of judges from one high court to another high court today the collegium with regard to transfer of judges from one high court to another high court is the chief justice of india plus four senior most judges the supreme court has already opined that the chief justice of india and the four senior most judges that is a collegium shall also consult the judges of the high court concerned before the judges are transferred from one high court to another high court so this recommendation which is given by the collegium is again binding upon the president with regard to the transfer okay so let us move to the next question look into the next question under the representation of people act 1951 so this question is going to deal with a specific aspect of the representation of people act 1951 under the representation of people act 1951 an elected representatives can be disqualified on the grounds of conviction for certain offenses so this is what the question says corrupt practices for interest in government contracts and works for failure to declare the election expenses which of the following can be considered to be corrupt practice under the act i'll just come to the context of this particular question but before that the representation of people act 1951 is considered to be the most important election law in our country if you look into this particular law the law says that if anybody any elected member of parliament or state legislature or for that matter any legislature if he is convicted of any offense that's a ground for their disqualification which is mentioned in section 8 of the representation of people act if anybody is engaged in any corrupt practice that is also a ground for their disqualification which is mentioned in section 8a of the representation of people act anybody engaged in any government contract that is a ground for their disqualification which is mentioned in section 9a of the representation of people act failure to declare the election expenses within a reasonable time frame is also a ground for their disqualification under section 10a of the representation of people act that means even if they get elected as a member of parliament or a member of state legislature still they can be disqualified on all these grounds and we already seen a number of examples say for example recently mr rahul gandhi was disqualified to be a member of parliament because he was convicted for more than 2 years or he is convicted for 2 years on the grounds of defamation so similarly these grounds will apply to the members of the parliament even if they get elected now what is the context why this particular question is important recently a case was filed in the allahabad high court veteran member of the congress party he challenged the election of an mla from the bjp party 
and what is the ground on which he has challenged the election of that particular person. The person who has challenged this particular election said that the person who has got elected from the BJP party as the MLA from the state of Uttar Pradesh has given false information in his affidavit with regard to the election, with regard to his educational qualification. So, in the opinion of the petitioner, a person giving false information with regard to his educational qualification would amount to corrupt practice. And we have already seen that anybody who is engaged in corrupt practice is a ground for disqualification. So, let us try to understand as to what happened in this particular case. Now, if you look into the representation of people act, representation of people act under section 123 defines as to what is a corrupt practice. And in fact, in this particular case, when the matter has gone to the court, the court was convinced that giving false information with regard to election practice, sorry, with regard to the educational qualification cannot be seen as a corrupt practice because the court was convinced that the people in our country, nobody vote to the candidates contesting the election seeing their educational qualification. And even if there is a false information with regard to the educational qualification, that has no way affected the outcome of this particular election and it has no way affected the free and fair election. So, giving this particular judgment, the candidate winning the election was upheld by the Allahabad High Court and subsequently the Supreme Court has also dismissed this particular matter. So, in this present context, let us try to understand as to what is considered to be a corrupt practice under the representation of people act for which we will have to understand as to what is given in the section 123 of the representation of people act 1951. So, if you go to section 123 of the representation of people act, it says, Bribing the voters is a corrupt practice. Bribing the voters means somebody is trying to bribe the voters before the election, which has an effect of altering the outcome of the election. That can be considered to be a corrupt practice. Undue influence upon the voters, which can prejudicially affect the outcome of the election. The undue influence can be use of coercive force, pressure upon the voters. So, all these things can be seen as a corrupt practice for which they are liable to be disqualified. Providing false information by the candidates, but again please understand this false information which is given by the candidates should have an effect of altering the outcome of the election. Unless and until it has the effect of altering the outcome of the election, this cannot be seen as a corrupt practice. So, this is also mentioned in the representation of people act. The promotion or attempted promotion of feeling of hatred between two different classes of citizens on the grounds of religion, race, community or language. So, at the time of election, somebody is trying to promote hatred between two different sections of society on these grounds that can be seen as a corrupt practice. Intentional publication of false statement, which can prejudicially affect the outcome of the election that can also be seen as a corrupt practice. Promises for freebies during the election. Promises for freebies during the election is not a corrupt practice under the Representation of People Act. Although the Supreme Court in the year 2013 has taken a strong exception that the Election Commission of India has to take serious measures to control the menace of the freebies and their impact on the election, but the Supreme Court has categorically said that promises of, for freebies cannot be seen as a corrupt practice. So, with this information, let us try to answer the question. So, which of the options given is the correct one? So, all the things are considered to be part of the corrupt practice except for the last one. So, the right answer would be option 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 only that is option C. Representation of people act is very, very important for your examination. And not only for your preliminary examination, such type of questions can also be asked in the mains examination. Let us move to the next question. So, this is with regard to the election of the Vice President of India. So, why this is important? Because recently, last year, Mr. Jagdeep Dankar was elected as the Vice President of India. So, in this context, uh, the provisions in the constitution related to the vice president of India may also be very relevant for your preliminary examination. 
come to statement number 1 look into the question consider the following statements with regard to the constitution of india statement 1 the normal function of the vice president of india is to act as the ex officio chairman of rajya sabha so ex officio means by virtue of getting elected as the vice president he automatically becomes the chairman of rajya sabha which means you will have to carefully remember that there is no election to the post of chairman rajya sabha whoever is elected as a vice president he automatically becomes the chairman of rajya sabha so the normal function of vice president of india is to act as the chairman of ex officio chairman of rajya sabha that is very much true but that is the normal function but however it is also important that you understand that the vice president will also discharge the duties of the president when the there is an absence in the office of the president so when he can do that when there is an absence to the office of the president or when there is also a vacancy so when there is a vacancy he will act as the president of india not more than a period of 6 months and when there is an absence during the absence he can discharge the duties of the president even if there is no absence or vacancy but the president is unable to perform his duties so for example the president has fallen seriously sick and during the time also the vice president of india can discharge the duties of the president statement number 2 the vice president is elected indirectly by an electoral college comprising of members of both the houses of parliament so what statement is saying saying the vice president is elected indirectly so that is true because he is not elected by an universal adult franchise but it is through an electoral college the electoral college comprises of members of both the houses of the parliament so this is very important here you have to make an understanding it should be very clear in your mind that it come it comprises of the members of both the houses of the parliament there is no distinction as to the elected members and nominated members in the houses of the parliament in fact, today there are no nominated members in the Lok Sabha, but still we have nominated members in the Rajya Sabha. So, it includes both the elected as well as the nominated members as a part of the electoral college. But however, you shall also remember that there is a distinction when it comes to the president. In president, it comprises of only the elected members and not the nominated members. Come to statement number 3. The value of vote of the members of the electoral college may vary from state to state depending upon the population of the state no in fact how the election of vice president happens it happens through a system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote but however the members of the electoral college consist of only the members of the parliament the value of vote of all the members are the same their value is in fact one okay as per the president vice president election act and the president vice president election rules 1974 this is the case there are few more information probably you can remember it is the election commission of india which has to carry out the election of the vice president of india and the election commission of india should also issue the notification for the election of vice president 60 days prior to the term of the incumbent vice president is coming to an end and normally there will be a presiding officer Oh, sorry a returning officer who would uh, in charge who would be the in charge of uh, carrying out the election process and all those things who is appointed by the election commission of india during the election so it is usually the secretary general of lok sabha or alternatively the secretary general of rajya sabha so these are all few information that you may remember so the value of votes of the members of the electoral college may vary from state to state depending upon the population so this is not the case Whereas this is the case with regard to the member of legislative assemblies who are also part of the electoral college when it comes to the presidential election, but not in case of the vice president. Which of the statements given above is are incorrect? While the statement 1 and 2 are correct, statement 3 is incorrect. Okay? So the right answer would be option B. Next question. Again, this question is related to the representation of people act 1951 this year definitely you, you may expect a question from the representation of people act because of the various current events that has happened but what this question is about before we go into these statements this question is about petition that was filed in the supreme court 
where the petitioner is challenging section 62 of the Representation of People Act 1951. So, what this section 62 of the Representation of People Act talks about? Section 62 of the Representation of People Act deals with a right to vote. Who can exercise the right to vote? Now, please understand under the constitution that is under article 326, we say that every adult individual shall have the right to vote. And article 325 of the constitution says that there shall be no discrimination when it comes to right to vote with regard to religion, race, caste and certain other things. And that is why we say that we have universal adult suffrage. But however, who shall have the right to vote shall further be regulated based on the law that is passed by the parliament. The constitution has given the power to the parliament to regulate that. Accordingly, the parliament has passed this representation of people act. Under the representation of people act, section 62 of the representation of people act says that there may be certain people who shall not have the right to vote. What section 62 of the representation of people act says? Under section 62 of the representation of people act, if any person is in police custody or if he is in prison or if he is in jail, even if he is an under trial, so this is very important, even if he is an under trial, even if he is an under trial, he or she shall not have the right to vote. Who is an under trial? An under trial is someone who is not yet found guilty in a court of law. The court is yet to decide whether the charges against him is true or not, but in the meantime, he is held up in the prison or he is held up in the jail. So, even he may not have the right to vote. But however, on the contrary, if you see, the same law says that whoever is in police custody or whoever is in jail shall not have the right to vote. But however, the same law says that even if a person is convicted, even if a person is convicted, but the person is out on bail, he is able to get the bail, but he is already convicted, his conviction has not yet been stayed, but he is just out on bail for certain reasons. And at the time there is an election, he will have the right to vote. So, this is exactly what is criticized by the petitioner that on the one hand, you are not even giving the right to vote to an uh, uh, under trial who is not yet proven guilty in a court of law. But you are saying that anybody who is even convicted but he is out on bail, he, she, he or she shall have the right to vote. So, the petitioner is of the opinion that this particular section that is section 62 of the Representation of People Act clearly violates article 14 of the constitution. So, this is the basic issue. In fact, the petitioner has also said that by allowing some kind of discrimination between these sets of people, it is clearly violative of Article 14 and the petitioner also highlighted, yes, uh, Article 14 also allows for positive discrimination. You can positively discriminate certain categories of people because Article 14 also provides for equal protection of laws, not just equality before law. But the petitioner said that the classification or the discrimination that is happening here is not a reasonable, it is not a reasonable classification. So, there exists an inherent discrimination in this and which is not intelligent and which is not reasonable and hence this section should be struck down. So, this is why this particular matter was there in the news. With this information, let us try to solve the first statement. Under the act, Anyone who is in the lawful custody of police or in prison shall have the right to vote. They shall not, sorry, okay, they shall not have the right to vote. So, this is true, okay. So, this is what we have been discussing, even if he is an under trial. In fact, there is also one more issue that is associated with this, that as per the data that is given by the National Crime Records Bureau, there are lakhs and lakhs of people who are in the jail as an under trial. That means you are disenfranchising a number of people from their right to vote, even before they are convicted in a court of law. So, that is an other issue and it has a serious implications upon the democracy like India. Come to statement number two. Any person who is kept under the preventive detention, although they may be in police detention, but it is a preventive detention, shall have the right to vote under the act. So, this is very, very important. On the one hand, the law is saying that somebody is in jail or in police custody shall not have the right to vote, they shall be deprived of the right to vote. 
but an exception has been provided for preventive detention. So, we have already understood in our previous lectures as to what is the difference between punitive and preventive detention. So, if an individual is in police custody, but on the grounds of preventive detention, he or she can exercise their vote, right to vote under article, sorry, under section 62 of the representation of people. So, this is also true. So, which of the statements given above is are incorrect? Both the statements are correct. So, the answer would be neither one nor two. Next question. So, this question is basically related to the economically weaker section reservation, which is also called as the EWS reservation. So, let me just uh, give a background behind this EWS reservation before we start discussing the question. The EWS reservation is not part of the original constitution and uh, you know that the EWS reservation is purely on the economic criteria and the constitution in the original form did not recognize the reservation in economic criteria. Initially, the reservation was given only on the social and educational backwardness. Social and educational backwardness or it was given to the social and educationally backward classes of the people. So, in order to provide a reservation solely on the economic criteria, the constitution was amended by the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act in the year 2019 and they inserted specifically two articles into part 3 of the constitution. One is article 15 clause 6 to give reservation on the economic criteria in the educational institutions and article 16 class 6 was also inserted by the same constitutional amendment act to give reservation in the public employment in public employment so this is the background that you should know and subsequently this economically weaker section reservation was challenged in the supreme court on number of grounds and number of questions was raised in front of the supreme court and the Supreme Court has recently upheld the EWS reservation. So, this EWS reservation is very much valid right now because the Supreme Court has already given its stamp and approval. So, in this context, it also becomes very important for your examination. So, there are a few questions that was raised in front of the Supreme Court as to what is the ground on which the petitioners were challenging this EWS reservation. Now, first uh, challenge as to why it was uh, brought in front of the Supreme Court is that can there be a purely economic criteria based on which the reservation can be given because the original constitution if you see the original constitution also has provisions like article 15 class 4 and article 15 class 5 which talks about reservation in the educational institutions but this is on the criteria of or on the basis of the social and educational backward classes and not on economic criteria and similarly, Article 16, Class 4 provides for reservation to the backward classes community in the public employment. So, that is also not a purely economic criteria. Okay. So, can it be acceptable? So, that was the first question. In fact, the Supreme Court said even someone who is economically weaker, even this is the if somebody is economically weaker or if somebody from an economically weaker section, he is deprived of various opportunities. So, you cannot say that he is not deprived and the very idea of social justice is to provide equal opportunities. So, even the economic deprivation can be a sole ground on which the reservation can be given. So, this particular question was upheld by the Supreme Court. Now, the second most important question is the 10 percent reservation. So, come to the first statement with the statement I will explain the second thing. The 10 percent reservation mandated under the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act also includes the economically weaker sections from the backward classes. Now, the next question is that, okay, you are giving 10 percent reservation. Okay. So, what is the reservation that they mandated by bringing in these articles? A maximum of 10 percent reservation. So, this 10 percent reservation that you are going to give in the educational institutions and the public employment, is it uh, only for the general community? or anybody who is economically weaker including the backward classes that is the second question. But in this particular case the Supreme Court categorically said already we have article 16 class 4 which provides reservation to the backward classes in public employment, article 15 class 4 and article 15 class 5 which provide reservation to 
the backward classes in the educational institution. So, this reservation on economic criteria will solely apply only to the general category and not to the others. So, who will get this 10 percent reservation? Only the general category. So, this reservation is not for the backward classes. So, the second question was answered. So, with this come to the statement, the 10 percent reservation mandated by the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act also includes the economically weaker sections from the backward classes. No, it does not include the economically weaker sections from the backward classes because anyways the backward classes are getting reservation because of article 15 class 4 and 5 and article 16 class 4. Come to the third statement, the economically weaker section reservation can also apply to the private unaided educational institution. So, is it open to the unaided private educational institutions also where you can give this EWS reservation or is it only in the government institution? That is the next question. The Supreme Court pointed out, look into Article 15, Class 5. Article 15, Class 5 provides reservation for the backward classes in the private educational institutions, be it aided or unaided. So, similarly, the EWS reservation can also be applied to the private educational institutions. Okay. So, that was, so it will also apply to the private educational institutions. So, the economically weaker section reservation can also apply to the private education institution. This is also true. What is the fourth question that was raised in front of this particular case? Is it breaching the 50 percent limit? Of course, it is breaching the 50 percent limit because already we know that one of the most important case in the history of India is the Indra Sani case with regard to the reservation. The Indra Sani case in the year 1992, the Supreme Court set a limit of 50 percent for the reservation. And in fact, in the Indra Sani case, the Supreme Court said any breach of 50 percent quota would amount to violation of the basic structure of the constitution because it is going to violate the rule of law. So, the last question that was raised is, is it violative of the basic structure where the breach of 50 percent because now on top of the existing reservation which is right now 50 percent in our country and then you give a 10 percent reservation to the economically weaker section. So, it will take the reservation up to 60 percent. So, is it legally tenable or is it violating the basic structure of the constitution? The Supreme Court said it is legally tenable, it is not violating the basic structure of the constitution for two reasons. First of all, the Supreme Court said that the 50 percent cap that was brought in by the Supreme Court in the Indra Sani case is only for the backward classes, whereas now the reservation is for an entirely different community. It is on the economic backwardness and it is an entirely different criteria. So, you cannot club these two things and you can say that it is breaching the 50 percent limit. So, that it is very much feasible. Now, the reason, the other reason which is also given by the Supreme Court is, now please understand, even in the Indra Sani case, the Supreme Court pointed out that the 50 percent limit was not something which can never be breached at all. It is not that it is inviolable. It can be breached under extraordinary circumstances. So, pointing out these two things, the Supreme Court said that yes, it can go above 50 percent and it does not, it does not violate the basic structure. It does not violate the basic structure. So, by giving all these judgments, the Supreme Court said that EWS reservation is very much valid. So, with this understanding, if you solve the equation, the statement 1 is anyways wrong because it is only for the general community. The economically weaker sections reservation can also apply to unaided private education institutions. So, this is true. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The correct statement is only statement B, that is option 2 only. Next question. So, consider the following statements with regard to the federal disputes. Why this question is very, very relevant? Earlier also, we have discussed one question with regard to the federal dispute. Now, this is also important because recently there was a stalemate between the state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. And now the Andhra Pradesh has approached the Supreme Court of India. Because although the state of Telangana was created by the Andhra Pradesh Reorganization Act, Act 2014, the apportionment of the assets and liabilities between these two states has not yet happened. And the issue is still lingering around for some time. So, to 
clear this issue, the Andhra Pradesh state government has approached the Supreme Court of India under Article 131 of the Constitution. We already discussed that if there is any dispute between any federal units in our country, be it between the centre and the state or be it between the state versus the state or be it a centre and state on one side and the other states on the other side, the affected party can directly approach the Supreme Court of India under Article 131 which provides for the original jurisdiction. So, in this context, this question becomes very important. See the first statement. The federal dispute between the states directly fall under the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Yes, very much true. That is under Article 131 of the Constitution. So, this particular statement is true. In fact, going to the Supreme Court is not the only solution because once you go to the court, then it is a long drawn battle. The Members of the Constant Assembly also thought there should be other ways, there should be other avenues also to address these federal disputes between the centre and the states or within the states and that is why they have provided one particular article in the constitution that is article 263 of the constitution. So, what is this article 263? Under article 263 of the constitution, the president is empowered to establish an interstate council which is right now established, I think after the recommendation of the Sarkaria Commission, the interstate council is established in our country by the president. But this interstate council is a very dysfunctional body, it is not functioning very effectively. But if this body has to function effectively, it is a body which has the most important executives in our country. Why? Because the membership of the interstate council consists of the prime minister himself, six cabinet ministers who can be nominated by the Prime Minister, in addition to that Chief Ministers of all the states, in addition to that the Chief Ministers of the Union Territories, in addition to that the Administrators of those Union Territories which is not having a Chief Minister. So, that means all the top executives are part of this particular interstate council. So, the idea is if there is any kind of issues between the states or between the centre and the state you can bring it to this particular forum and you can discuss and you can get the issues sorted out. That is the idea as to why it is established, but unfortunately, as I already said, it is not a very effective or it is a very functional body. So, come to the second statement. The idea of having body like interstate council is to take up such matters and to resolve the differences without going into the courts. When I say such matters means any federal disputes, okay. So, this is statement is very much true. Come to statement number three. In addition to this interstate council, you should also be aware of a body which is called as the zonal councils. The zonal councils are the statutory body established under the State Reorganization Act 1956. In addition to the interstate council, when the State Reorganization Act was passed in 1956, it also provided for zonal council. So, zonal council means that there will be four or five states every zone. In fact, the country was divided into five zones. Every zone will have certain number of states, five to six states and for each and every zonal council, the Home Minister of India, the Union Home Minister will be the chairperson. So, in addition to the Union Home Minister, the Chief, the chief Ministers of all the states will also be part of it. So, the idea, it, idea is at the national level, you have the, uh, the interstate council, but at a regional level, you have something which is called as the zonal councils and the zonal councils may take up the issues between the states and all those things and it can be sorted out or the regional level issues among the states can also be sorted out. That is the idea of having a zonal council. It is a statutory body because it is established under the State Reorganization Act. Okay? So, this is also not very functional in our country unfortunately. So, with this information, if you solve the statement, which of the statements given above is are correct? The right statement is all the statements, that is all of the above is the right answer. Next question. So, this question is related to the office of profit. Now, why this office of profit uh, was there in the news? Otherwise, also this office of profit is a very important topic. Recently, there were certain news reports that Mr. Hemant Soren, who was the Chief Minister of Jharkhand, has engaged 
in certain mining contracts and thereby he is liable to be disqualified uh, on the grounds of office of profit although the reports are unverified and after that uh, there was not much news but however the word office of profit was reported for this particular reason in this particular question so let us try to understand as to what is this office of profit and before we discuss as to what is this office of profit there are also certain articles that becomes very relevant for our discussion one is article 102 and other is article 191 of the constitution we already discussed about these articles article 102 and article 199 or 91 of the constitution deals with the grounds for disqualification of the members of the parliament so both deals with what it is the disqualification of the members of the parliament so article 102 in case of the members of parliament and article 191 in case of the members of the state legislature in fact they provide for certain grounds on which they can be disqualified and the first ground under these articles is if legislator that is be a member of parliament or a member of state legislature if they hold on to office of profit if they hold on to any office of profit that's a ground for their disqualification so we'll have to understand as to what is this office of profit okay so not only the office of profit if they are unsound mind if they turn out to be unsound mind if they turn out to be an undischarged insolvent four if they voluntarily give up the citizenship five also on the grounds of any law that can be made by the parliament in fact uh, the fifth ground is very important because today a number of members of the parliament and state legislature are disqualified based on the representation of people like 1951 and the parliament is empowered to do so because the constitution gives them the power under article 102 and article 191 of the constitution now come to the first thing which is the focus of attention for this particular question that they can be disqualified on the grounds of office of profit now so we'll have to understand as to what is this office of profit in the first place but then the biggest problem is the constitution doesn't define as to what is an office of profit the constitution only says that uh, any member of parliament holding on to any office of profit shall be a ground for their disqualification and because it is not defined in the constitution we'll have to understand that the court has given the interpretation as to what is office of profit in number of cases one such interesting case is the jaya bachan versus the union of india Jaya Bachchan case in the year 2006. So, Jaya Bachchan was a member of parliament in Rajya Sabha and she was also appointed to the Uttar Pradesh Film Development Corporation at that point of time. So, basically the idea of uh, not allowing a member of parliament or a state legislature to occupy any executive office, any executive office, somebody, a legislature occupying an executive office would be considered to be an office of profit so the idea behind this is you don't allow a legislator to be a legislate in, in, in legislative capacity as well and at the same time occupy an executive office because that would create a conflict of interest because the very idea of the legislature is to make the executives accountable and what will happen if uh, a person from the legislative organ is also occupying the executive office so we will not be able to discharge his functions effectively and that's why probably this provision was there in the constitution itself so what happened in Jaya Bachchan case, Jaya Bachchan being a member of parliament, she was appointed as a chairperson of the Uttar Pradesh Film Development Corporation which is an executive post under the state government of Uttar Pradesh. So for that reason Jaya Bachchan was disqualified and then subsequently Jaya Bachchan challenges in the court. She said that she is not liable to be disqualified because she knew that she was occupying an executive office but he has never taken a even a single penny as a salary and as long as she is not taking the salary or profit out of that particular office it cannot be seen as an office of profit the supreme court said what can be seen as an office of profit or an office is to be ascertained whether it is an office of profit or not an office of profit based on whether you actually receive the salary or the profit that is not material what is material that is immaterial and what is material is whether the salary or the profit is receivable in the first place so in this case the office is providing for the salary but you have not taken it personally so 
even in that particular case it would be considered to be an office of profit because the salary or the profit was receivable in the first place so this is one of the important clarification that is given by the supreme court so what is an office of profit any office executive character be it under the center state or under the local authorities and if the profit or the salary is receivable in the first place even if the individual has not taken the salary or the profit still it can be considered to be an office of profit okay so what is important is if the profit is receivable so receivable in the first place it can be seen as an office of profit so with this let us try to solve the statements statement one the office of profit is well defined in the constitution and it is also a ground for disqualification of the members of parliament and the state legislature so partially it is true it is a ground for disqualification but it is not well defined so it is nowhere defined in the constitution so now there can be a question in the minds of the students that on the one hand we are saying that office of profit is a ground for disqualification now in our country there are number of members of parliament who are appointed as the ministers in fact the prime minister himself is a member of parliament and the cabinet ministers are members of parliament and they are drawing a salary for occupying the office of ministers so will that not amount to an office of profit so for such things if you look into the constitution the constitution also says that any member of parliament occupying any office of profit shall be liable to be disqualified but however certain office can be exempted based on the law that is made by the parliament so accordingly the parliament has passed the prevention of disqualification act nineteen fifty nine so any office although it is executive in nature if it is exempted under this particular act those officers would not be considered to be an office of profit similarly the state legislature can make laws in their respective states and they can exempt certain office from being an office of profit statement number two any person holding on to office of profit is not eligible to contest election to the office of the president except for those officers exempted under the law which means which is exempted under the constitution of india so this is also very much true even for the president and the constitution says the qualifications for the office of the president there are certain qualifications and one of the qualification is that he should not hold on to any office of profit and if he is holding on to any office of profit he is not eligible to contest the election he has to step down from that office of profit and then he can contest the election but however the constitution itself exempts certain office not to be considered to be an office of profit for anybody to contest election to the office of the president so what are those offices exempted the exempted offices include the office of president the office of vice president the post of governors and the post of ministers be it a central minister or the state ministers if any person is occupying these offices it is not necessary for them to step down their from their office before contesting the election because these officers would not be considered to be office of profit so this particular statement is true which of the statements given above is are incorrect so the incorrect statement is only the first statement so the right answer is option that is option a that is one only okay so all these questions that you have been discussing is one way or the other related to the current affairs and we are discussing the current context and also how it is related to the conventional areas next question the next question is uh, related to the issue of hate speech in our country so let us try to understand uh, what is hate speech the issue of hate speech in the recent past has become one of the most important uh, issues in our country and in fact uh, the incidence of hate speech ha has been reported in various parts of the countries like delhi uttar pradesh uttarakhand and which is very unfortunate but uh, it is a serious threat to our country right now and that's why this question is also very important or this topic is also very important for the examination now one of the biggest problem with regard to hate speech in our country is today we do not have a well defined law we do not have a specific or a formal law to deal with the issue of hate speech it is only that we have some of the provisions the 
Indian Penal Code and the representation of People Act to deal with the issue of hate speech. And the Law Commission of India has also suggested certain recommendations to deal with the issue of hate speech. So, what basically is this uh, hate speech? So, hate speech is form of uh, speech or you can say communication which is intentional in nature and which has the ability to provoke violence between two sections of the society or promote hatred between two sections of the society. It can be on any basis, it can be on the grounds of religion, race, caste, whatever be it, all these things can be seen as a hate speech. There are number of incidents, especially there were certain events which is called as the religious censor, the religious parliament, where the resolutions has been passed by the majority community to act violently, openly against the minority communities. These are all very unfortunate and subsequently the matter has gone to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has directed the law enforcement agencies to file cases against those people on the grounds of hate speech. So, in this context, let us try to understand uh, the statements which is given here. Statement 1, the parliament has recently enacted a comprehensive law to formally deal with the issue of hate speech in our country. So, there is no comprehensive law as of it in our country. And it is just that some of the provisions like section 153A of IPC, section 295A of IPC are presently used to deal with this issue of hate speech. What is this section 153A of IPC? Section 153A of IPC is dealing with anyone who is trying to promote disharmony between two sections of society. So, that is section 2, 153A of IPC and promote disharmony between two sections of society. So, such things can be seen as hate speech. And what is section 295 of the IPC? Section 295 of IPC is somebody who is intentionally outraging. So, if somebody is intentionally intentionally outraging the religious belief belief or somebody is outraging the sentiment of a particular religion then that's a punishable offense which can also be seen as a hate speech in addition to that there are also certain provisions under the representation of people act rpa 1951 especially section 123 section 125 now all these provisions may also be invoked to take action against someone who is engaging against a hate speech especially this comes with regard to the candidates who are contesting the election so this is generally so with this information come to the statement parliament has recently enacted a comprehensive law formally to deal with the issue of hate speech in our country so this is wrong statement 2 there are certain provisions in the Indian Penal Code which is also used by the law enforcement agencies to act against incidents of hate speech in the society. So, this is very much true. So, these are all provisions of the Indian Penal Code. So, this particular statement is very much true. So, which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So, the incorrect statement is option A only. Let us move to the next question. So, this uh, particular question is related to the constant assembly. So, the constant assembly is a static topic, but this year it was also reported in the current affairs because July 22nd, 1947 was the day when the constant assembly of India has adopted the national flag of India. So, the national flag was India was adopted by a resolution in the constant assembly on this particular day. But then last year mark that is July 22nd, July 22nd, 9, uh, sorry, 2020-22. So, July 22nd, 2022 has marked the 75 years of the adoption of the national flag by the National Assembly. So, sorry, by the Constant Assembly. So, in this context, it was also reported in the newspaper. So, you should also have a basic idea of as to the constant assembly we all know that the constant assembly of india was established based on the cabinet mission plan based on the cabinet mission plan they wanted to establish a constant assembly of india so the idea is that this constant assembly would draft the constitution for the entire country 
Although initially that both the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, they were not agreeing for their own reasons, they agreed to have a constant assembly. And the constant assembly is to be devised on the following plan. So, there is to be representatives from both the British provinces. So, the British provinces were at that point of time where it had an elected government and there was also something which is called as the princely states. The princely states did not have an elected uh, government and it was uh, ruled by the respective rulers. They had internal autonomy but submitted to the uh, British king or the queen. So, the provinces were to have 292 seats and the princely states were to have 93 seats in the constant assembly. Now, all the members of the British provinces were to be elected by indirect election. There was no system of direct election. In fact, they were to be elected by the elected members of the provincial legislature. Because the provincial legislative elections happened uh, uh, somewhere in 1945 46. So, they already had the elected members. And the members of the provincial legislature were selected by adult suffrage. There was direct election there. But, however, it was not universal adult suffrage, it was a very limited adult suffrage, I would say. Around 25 to 28 percent of the people were, have, were given the voting rights. It was based on number of parameters like their uh, literacy, it was based on the parameters like tax paying ability, the property owners, only very limited people were given the right to vote. So, the elected members of the legislative assemblies of the provinces, they in turn voted and they elected the uh, uh, provinces. Okay? So, they in turn elected the members of the constant assembly from the provinces. In case of princely states, it was through nomination. The ruler of the princely state could nominate directly their representatives to the constant assembly. In addition to these two things, the princely states and the British province, there was also something which is called as the commissioner provinces. To put it in a very simple way, it is equivalent to that of today union territories. These were provinces under the British control, but there was no elected government. There was a, a ruler, there was an administrator who was appointed by the British government. So, there are four commissioner provinces. So, each commissioner province was to have one representation in the constant assembly. So, overall the idea under the cabinet mission plan is uh, to have 389 members in the constant assembly. So, this is the basic idea that you should have. But however, uh, you know that after the constant assembly uh, was established, the first meeting happened on 9th uh, uh, December 1946 and then on 13th December 1946. Jawaharlal Nehru introduced the significant, the historical object, objectives resolution, which is nothing like a framework or which is like a, a foundation for the constitution, which contained the foundation values for the future constitution of India to be drafted by the constant assembly. In fact, this uh, objectives resolution was later modified in the present version of the preamble today in the constitution. So, these are all information that you have to remember. And, but however, after uh, the partition, the members of the Muslim League, they were not part of the constant assembly. Most of them have gone to Pakistan and hence considerably the size of the constant assembly has reduced. So, after uh, the partition, the size of the constant assembly has reduced to 299 and then subsequently the constant assembly continued drafting the constitution of India. Lot of debates have happened and after all these debates, it was finally put to vote and then uh, the constitution was adopted and the constitution was adopted on 26 November 1949 and it came into force that is what we call it to be the republic on 26 January 1950. Okay? So, these are all few factual informations that you should know with regard to the constituent assembly. The constituent assembly had few major committees as well. If you want you can just go through eight major committees in the parliament in the constituent assembly. So, consider the following statements with regard to the constant assembly. The assembly was completely an elected body. No, it had nominated members as well. We have seen nominated members from the princely states, from the commissioner provinces. The members of the constant assembly was elected through universal adult franchise. There was no universal adult franchise. The members of the constant assembly was in fact in, elected by an indirect election. It is only the members of the provincial legislature was elected directly and that too based on limited adult franchise. So, this particular statement is also wrong. 
the constant assembly had representation only from the British provinces. No, it had representation from the princely states as well, from the commissioner provinces as well. Which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So, the incorrect option would be all of the above, that is option D. Let us quickly go to the last question for today's discussion, which is again looks as if it is a static topic, that is the topic of preamble. But this is also related to the current affairs because recently one of the veteran leaders of the BJP party, Mr. Subramanya Swami, he has challenged the 42nd constitutional amendment happened in their 1976 with regard to the preamble. We know that the preamble was amended once and by the 42nd constitutional amendment act and they have inserted uh, rather three words that is secular, socialist and the word integrity but Mr. Subramanya Swami has challenged these two words inserted into the preamble that is secular and socialist. In fact, he is of the opinion that these things were not part of the original constitution and the constant assembly never had the intention to put these words into the preamble and hence these amendments should be declared to be void. So, that is the petition that he has filed but then the matter is pending in the Supreme Court. So, anyways let us try to understand the basics of the preamble. So, preamble as we all know that it is nothing but an introduction and but we can also say that it gives the summary of the entire constitution, it provides a preface to the constitution. But most importantly what the Supreme Court of India has said, the Supreme Court of India has said that the preamble is nothing but it is a key to unravel the minds of the makers of the constitution. This is what the Supreme Court has said in the Berubar Union case. What is this preamble? The preamble is a key to unravel the minds of the makers of the constitution, which means if there is any ambiguity with regard to any provisions of the constitution, how do you understand, how do you interpret this constitution? It is through the words in the preamble. The preamble is containing the philosophical aspects of the constitution and then you can use them to unravel, to understand the words in the constitution. You can understand the minds of the members in the constituent assembly. That is something that is very much true. In fact, the most important question with regard to the preamble that you might have was that whether the preamble is an integral part of the constitution. So, initially the Supreme Court said no, the preamble is not an integral part of the constitution. But then the Supreme Court has uh, changed its own stand in the next case that is in the Keshavan and the Bharati case in 1973. While in the Berubari Union case, the Supreme Court said that the preamble is not an integral part of the constitution. In the Keshavan and the Bharati case in 1973, the Supreme Court said, yes, the preamble is very much an integral part of the constitution. So, to that extent, the Supreme Court differed with regard to the Berubar Union case in the case of one of the Bharati case. But however, in both the cases, one thing looks similar is that although in the case of one of the Bharati case, they said that the preamble is an integral part of the constitution, the Supreme Court made it very clear the preamble is not source of authority to any organs of the state neither to the legislature nor to the parliament and in fact to the judiciary also. It does not provide any powers. So, it neither give power or it take away the powers. If anything is done by any organ of the state, it is because certain provisions are mentioned inside the constitution. The preamble is used just to understand the provisions of the constitution, nothing more than that. Okay. So, the statement, second statement, they are integral part of the constitution but neither give power nor take away the powers of any organs of the state. So, this is also true. Now, the Supreme Court in the Keshavananda Bharati case in 1973 has said that the preamble is an integral part of the constitution and anything that is integral part of the constitution can be amended and we know that. And they can be amended under article 368 of the constitution. The Supreme Court made it clear the preamble can also be amended. But then the only thing that you have to remember is that you can amend the preamble, but something which is declared to be part of the basic structure of the preamble cannot be amended. That is the most important thing. So, for example, in the very same case, in the case of another Bharati case, the Supreme Court pointed out the words in the preamble like democratic, the words like republic and the various values like liberty, justice, all to be part of the basic structure. So, anything which is declared to be part of basic structure, they cannot be amended, but otherwise a preamble can be amended. So, in fact, by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976, we have already seen 
that the words like socialist, secular and the words like integrity has been added to the preamble. So, the preamble can very much be amended. Even tomorrow you can amend, we can amend the preamble if the parliament has a majority to do that. But it cannot destroy something which has been declared to be part of the basic structure. So, they can be amended without any restrictions. They cannot be amended without any restrictions because the power of the parliament to amend the constitution after the Keshavan and the Bharati case is not unlimited. Rather, it is limited to the extent that they cannot destroy the basic structure. So, they can be amended without any restrictions would be wrong. So, which of the statements given above is or incorrect? So, the incorrect statement would be statement 3 only that is option C is the right answer. So, with this uh, today we will end the discussion of the important topics uh, for today. We will continue with the next set of important topics in the next class. Okay? All the very best to all of you just keep watching all these videos for maximum benefit do not miss any of the classes so that you can attend most of the questions and get most of the questions right in the preliminary examination. And to get more updates, you can also subscribe to the Study IQ English channel. All the very best. God bless. Thank you very much.